want to welcome you on this fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Of course, it is also Father's Day, and so um, I always, on both on Mother's Day and on Father's Day, like to uh, uh, kind of extend the, the, the uh, uh, greeting and the honors to all the men of the congregation, you know, the, the fathers and the grandfathers and the uncles and the big brothers and all of the adult men uh, who play such an important part in this church and in their families. And so God's blessings to all of you today on this uh, 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 Father's Day and uh, wish you God's blessings the rest of the day as you celebrate that. We have a number of things that uh, I want to lift out of uh, uh, for today, beginning with our birthdays. We have lots of birthdays, and uh, I was looking next week. We don't have a lot of birthdays, but, but uh, this week we do. Um, and starting today, uh, June 20th, uh, Sunday, Rob Dunn has a birthday. And Rob, I didn't see the Dunns come in. They were here last week. Are they back there? Not here today, but happy birthday to Rob Dunn today. On Monday, June 21st, Parker Johnson has a birthday, so happy birthday to Parker. Uh, tomorrow, it's going to be 17. So, um, oh boy, to be 17 again, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Wednesday, June 23rd, uh, Ruth Ann Galantine has a birthday. Happy birthday to Ruth Ann. On Thursday, uh, June 24th, Lynn Holland has a birthday, so happy birthday uh, this week to Lynn. Uh, Friday, Ju- June 25th, we have two birthdays. Uh, Kelly Phillips has a birthday, so happy birthday to Kelly. Uh, Kelly. And also, Devin Keller has a birthday. Uh, he'll be 21 this week, so happy birthday uh, to those two. And then on Saturday, June 26th, Emily Adamow has a birthday, so happy birthday this coming week to Emily as well. Also, uh, we have all those birthdays, and we also have a, a zero birthday. We had a, we had a birth of a baby this week. Friday, June 18th, uh, Zane Howard Mary was, um, was born, and he was down in Texas, uh, his father is Joshua Mary, uh, who is the son of Jody Feist. And so Jody Feist is the, the happy uh, grandmother. And Dale and Barb, uh, Dale's back there, Barb's right there, are the great-grandparents. So congratulations on, on your great-grandchild, uh, Zane Howard Mary, who was born on Friday, June 18th, down in Texas. We have a couple of anniversaries, or actually three anniversaries this week. Today, June 20th. Uh, is the anniversary of Brian and Ashley Bushy. They're celebrating their 12th anniversary. They, of course, have just in the last few weeks moved down to uh, Tennessee, and so um, hopefully they're watching us on, they'll watch us online. Happy, birth, or happy anniversary, Brian and Ashley. And then uh, also today, Dwayne and Marianne Smith celebrating 51 years today. Had the 50th last year, 51 today. And then also this week on Tuesday, June 22nd, Josh and Nicole Burke are celebrating their second wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary to the two of you. (laughs) We have a number of folks we want to lift up in our prayers. Uh, We we continue to pray with people who have been dealing with cancer. And these folks are all at kind of different places in that journey. Uh, But we continue to lift up Kim Darrow and Marvin Hartz and Jeanette Dunn and Matt Scruggs, and Matt's mother, Susan Scruggs, uh, Anna Meyer. Uh, we have a couple of names of people who are dealing with cancer that we're not uh, mentioning publicly, but uh, um, we want to lift them up. They're included in those prayers. Uh, ongoing concerns for John Purvis, and Kate Newby, and Mary Hull, and Sarah Himes. Also, a couple of new ones to add to that. Pat Anderson, uh, Tom's sister, um, she's had a lot of breathing issues and problems, and was uh, in the hospital uh, uh, this week, and our thoughts and prayers are with Pat. She's out in Macomb, and, and so our prayers go with Pat Anderson. And also Lonnie Swinford. Lonnie Swinford uh, uh, is down at uh, 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 OSF in Peoria today, right now, St. Francis. She's there right now awaiting a procedure to uh, get, pull out some gall, gall stones, and they're hoping they can take those gall stones out without removing the gallbladder. So that's our prayer, but they won't know until they get in there whether that's possible. So So she's having that fun procedure done today, and we want to lift her up in our prayers and all others that we name in our hearts as well. Um, Other notes about today. Today we're going to have a first communion. Uh, Abe Adamow is going to have his first communion. And the way we're going to do that, when communion time comes, I'm going to uh, ask Abe to come up with his whole family, those who are here with him, and they'll come and they'll kneel at the altar rail. And and, um, while, while they're coming forward, the ushers will be handing out the little communion cups to all of you. And uh, I will hand out the communion cups to Abe and his family, and then I'll commune them up here, 
and then uh, when they're going back to their seats, I'll step back up to the altar and the rest of us will commune. Geeks so that's the way we're uh, going to do it. Um, they're going to be with us today and then another Sunday in July. Um, and so um, uh, we're going to do Abe's first communion today. So congratulations to you, Abe, on this very special day. A lot of other things coming up. Uh, our Vacation Bible School is on uh, July 11th through 15th. That's a Sunday through a Thursday. And um, back in the back, do you hear the train whistle? Yeah. It's called Rocky Railway. And uh, Dale's got a nice little uh, train set up back there. We'll have it running after the service. And, and uh, just kind of an invitation to all the kids. Sign up for Rocky Railway VBS. And you can do that through our website. You can download the form and sign, sign it and, or fill it in. And you can drop it off at the church or you can mail it in. And uh, you can talk to Mary Ann Smith if you have any questions. And, and yes, Mary Ann. Oh, you just raised your hand. I thought you had a question. No. <laughs> uh, so Mary Ann's up here. And, and if you have any questions about Bible school, come and talk to her after church. She'd love to, love to answer that. And we want to see how many kids, if we can get all these kids to come to Bible school, that would be awesome. And then also, um, uh, Sue Scruggs is in charge of the kitchen. We do a meal. At, we're doing it from 5 to 7.30 as Bible school, and it starts with a meal at 5 o'clock in the fellowship hall downstairs. And, uh, and so Sue needs some help getting, gathering all the food items for that. And there are a bunch of sign-up sheets in the back, and you can sign up to bring a certain food item. Are they signed up by day or just uh, drop off that week or something? drop off that week. So you, you sign up for a food item, and then she has little slips that are, are, are laying there, and you write what you signed up for on a slip and take that with you so you don't forget what you signed up for. Um, and, and some people in the past have said, you know, I may not be able to go uh, shopping and get something, but I'd like to do something. And, and, and cash donations are always fine because they're always running out to get things that they need more of. And so if you want to make a cash donation, that would be great as well. So that table is on the out in the back there as well, and hopefully you'll step up for that. And uh, other things, um, I'm going to be going on vacation. I leave, uh, Lisa and I are leaving on Tuesday uh, this, this week. Uh, actually, we'll be leaving Monday night. We're going to stay overnight somewhere, and we're going to catch our flight early Tuesday morning. We're going out to Santa Monica to see our new granddaughter for the first time. And, and so we'll be back on the evening of the 29th. And during the time that I'm gone, uh, Pastor Gene Vincent and Pastor Scott Schmidt are going to cover if there are any emergencies. Um, but uh, uh, we're going to be gone that time. And next Sunday, Pastor Norm Femright will be here again. He and Karen will be here, and they will be, uh, uh, he'll be covering the service, the worship service. And so thank you to Pastor Norm for doing that. And uh, uh, also, the day after we get back, so we get back on the 29th, on the 30th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, um, Tommy Larson, we're going to be doing a memorial service for him at the church here. He passed away last October, um, and, uh, and because of COVID, we weren't able to do a service at that time. So we're going to do a service, memorial service on, Tuesday, on Wednesday, June 30th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a visitation here at the church at 1 o'clock, so an hour visitation, and then the service at 2 on June the 30th. And that's a lot of announcements, but that's all of them. And so we are ready to begin our worship. If you'd please rise, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessing of family. And today we, we thank you for fathers and grandfathers and uncles and big brothers and all the men who, who have an opportunity to make a difference in this church and in their families and in this community. Bless them as you bless all of our families. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue now with our confession and forgiveness. You'll see it on the screens before you. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pray with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn today is number 812, Faith of Our Fathers. We continue on the screen before you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over the land and sea, sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us, by your power preserve us, by your wisdom instruct us, and by your hand protect us, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the first lesson is found in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1 to 13. Now there arose a great outcry of the people of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money from the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards, 
Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it, for other men have, have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been said to the nations, but you even sell your brother that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let's abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been extracting from them. Then, they said, <clears throat> we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as they say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep his promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. The word of the Lord. Today's psalm is 107, verse 1 to 3, and 23 to 32. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. And gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths, their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let, Let them, them extol, extol him, him in the, the congregation, congregation of the people, of the people and, and praise him, him in the assembly of, of the elders. The second lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 to 13. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing but possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own afflictions. In return, I speak as children, widen your hearts also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise now for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel is heard according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And what 
talking about is the Sea of Galilee. They, Jesus' ministry normally took him to the north and the northwestern part of the sea, and then occasionally he would get in a boat and cross over to the eastern side, and what was on the eastern side was a largely Gentile population over there. So Jesus said, let us go over there. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is, you know, who is this guy that we've been following? Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The gospel of the Lord. Please be seated, and we invite the kids to come forward for the children's message. <clears throat> All right, come on down, set anywhere on these the front rows there, on the red seats there. We've got a lot of kids here, so good to see everybody. Well, I think, it, I think we're going to have to say good morning to everybody because there's so many of you. We can say it really loud and we can wake everybody up. You ready? I'll say it and you say it back to me. Good morning. Good morning. Did you guys all hear that? All right. Well, good to see all of you today. Today is a, is a special day. What is the special day that is today? Do you know? Do you know, Lucy? Father's Day. That, you knew it too, didn't you? Yeah, it's Father's Day. And it's a day when we give thanks to God for, for our fathers and grandpas and, and uh, uh, uncles and big brothers, all the special men who are in our lives, who make a difference in our lives. And I was going to show you some things about my father, my dad, on this earth. Um, this is a picture of my dad. This is when he finished basic training in the Navy. Right after he got out of high school, he went into the Navy and he did uh, basic training. And that's his picture. He was born on May 26, 1937, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's something you should kind of learn the, the birthdays of your parents, uh, you know, so you have those in your mind. It's kind of nice to know those special days. My dad was, was born and raised in the town of Joliet, Illinois. So he was from Joliet, and uh, he liked to remind us that he was 100% Irish, yeah. And uh, the other side is the Norwegian side for me. But uh, and my dad, I've talked to us about this before, he loved baseball, yeah. My dad loved baseball, and he especially loved the Cubs, which was really strange since he was from the south side, Joliet, and all his family were White Sox fans. He was a rebel and became a Cub fan. And my dad loved the big bands, especially Glenn Miller. And I love Glenn Miller's music today because dad had all kinds of Glenn Miller records that we used to listen to. But what he loved, especially on this earth, was his family. And on October 17th, 1959, October 17th, 1959, he married my mom. And there's their wedding picture right there. Yeah. And it didn't take them too long before they had five boys who were just, just always the best little boys ever. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, we all got our baseball gloves on there. I'm this one right here, and we're... We were very close together in age, and we're still close to this today. Today, And my dad taught us so many things. He taught us how to play baseball, taught us how to work really hard. He was really, he was the first person in his family that went to college, and so he really pushed to, to do well in school. He taught us that. He also taught us um, never to pull his finger when he asked us to pull his finger. <laughs> Don't do that, you know, so... Um, but my dad, my dad wasn't on this earth for very long. He passed away on July 10th, 1976, and uh, he was only 39 years old. And the greatest thing of all was that before he left this earth, he, he gave his heart and he came to believe in, in trust in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Yeah. And that was so important because, because then he knew when he believed in Jesus that he had a father in heaven 
the same Father that all of us have, right? We have God the Father. And even though we have lots of men in our lives on this earth, uh, the most important Father that we have is our Father in heaven. And because we have a Father in heaven who loves us very much, and because we, it, we believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, we have the promise that one day we're going to live with our Father in heaven. Isn't that a great promise for Father's Day? That you have a Father in heaven who wants you to live forever with him. And when we get to heaven, we're going to get to see all those people who have gone before us, all those people that we loved, and, and it's going to be a wonderful reunion up there. We're going to be on this earth for a, for a long time yet, but one day we're going to get to see our Father in heaven face to face, and that's going to be a very special day. So on this day, on this Father's Day, let's say a prayer, and let's uh, thank God for all of the fathers and the uh, other men in our lives, and let's thank him especially for who he is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that uh, you have given us special men in our lives uh, who have uh, uh, made a difference for us, and we pray that you would strengthen all of our family ties on this Father's Day. But thank you most of all that every one of us has, a, has another father, and you are that father in heaven. Thank you that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, one day we will get to see you face to face in heaven, and you're going to welcome us into heaven and say, come and be with your father forever. Thank you so much for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good to see all of you guys. And uh, before you head back to your seats, you can come up and, and you can get a treat up here. And while you're doing that, we're going to sing our next hymn, which is Children of the Heavenly Father. We continue today with the sermon series on the book of Nehemiah, God's faithful servant. Today is part four of that series, which I've titled Walk in the Fear of Our God. Uh, the text is uh, that text uh, that we re was read earlier from Nehemiah chapter five. And I want to read one verse for you again. This is verse nine. Nehemiah said this to the people. He said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, many years ago, when my good old uncle Ole and Aunt Lena were very young, their son Hans was acting up in Sunday school, giving his teacher a really rough time. And finally, Pastor Inkvist called Ole and, and told Ole about the trouble they were having with him in, in, in Sunday school with, with Hans. And, Ole said, I know what you're talking about. He's been giving his teacher trouble at the regular school, too, and he's even causing a lot of problems for us here at home. And Pastor Inkvist said, well, I have an idea. If you could bring Hans to my office this Saturday morning, I'd like to try to talk to him. And so on Saturday morning, he took Hans over to the church, and they were welcomed into the pastor's office. And after a few minutes of chit-chat, they got down to business. Pastor Inkvist, what he really wanted to do was impress upon Hans that God was always watching him no matter where he was. And so he looked Hans squarely in the eye and he said, Hans, do you know where God is? And Hans kind of looked at his feet and said nothing. And so Pastor Inkvist asked it again a little more forcefully, Hans, do you know where God is? And suddenly Ole uh, said, Pastor, could I be excused for a moment? And Pastor Inkvist said, yeah, sure, Ole, that'll give me and Hans a chance to talk alone. So Ole stepped out of the office and then and he closed the door behind him and he hustled down the hall to the phone in the church kitchen and he called home and Lena answered and Lena said, Ole, have you and Hans talked to the pastor yet? And 
Oli said, yeah, Lena, he is still in there. And Lena said, well, well, what did the pastor say? And Oli said, Lena, it's worse than we thought. She said, what do you mean? And he said, well, Lena, apparently God is missing, and they think Hans had something to do with it. <laughs> well, I don't think Oli quite understood the point that Pastor Inkvist was trying to make, but the pastor was just trying to remind Hans that God is everywhere, that that he is what theologians call omnipresent. And because God is omnipresent, because he is present everywhere, he sees everything that we do. There is nothing that we do in this world that we really get away with, because God sees it. And in our story for today, Nehemiah wants to remind the Jewish people of that very same thing. He wants to kind of prick their consciences. He wants to shake them up. He wants to remind them that God is watching what they do. In particular, God is watching how they are treating the poor and the oppressed brothers and sisters. And that that should scare them. (laughs) And it should cause them to be ashamed because of the way they were treating them. It should cause them to repent of their sins and change their sinful ways. So the title of my sermon is what Nehemiah wants from the people of Israel. He wants them to walk in the fear of our God. And that is something that every every one of us should do every day of our lives. Our story begins with a new problem for Nehemiah. Now up to this point in the story, Nehemiah has been dealing with what I would call outside problems. When he first arrived in Jerusalem, he had to assess the situation of the wall around the city. It had been completely torn down, destroyed by the Babylonians, Uh, when they hauled the Jewish people away into exile in 586 B.C. And now here we are, 90 years after the exile has ended, and the wall is still in ruins. And the Jewish people are poor and oppressed and vulnerable. So Nehemiah tackled that problem. He surveyed the whole length of the wall. He put together a building plan, rallied the people to do the work, and then he immediately had to deal with another outside problem. Once the people started working on the wall, the people of the surrounding nations got upset. They had been oppressing and exploiting the Jewish people for almost a century. You know, the Jews had become the permanent underclass that the surrounding nations could easily take advantage of because they couldn't really defend themselves. But they knew if the Jews build a wall around Jerusalem, then they will be able to defend themselves and they will grow stronger, and the other nations will no longer be able to dominate and exploit them. And so the surrounding nations were planning to attack the Jews who were working on the wall and to bring the project to a a halt. And those workers started to be afraid. We talked about that last week. And they were talking about abandoning the project and going home. But Nehemiah came up with another plan, a plan this time to defend his workers while they were building the wall. And Nehemiah then challenged those surrounding nations. He said, if you attack us, we will be ready, and we will fight back, and you will pay a heavy price. And so those surrounding nations backed off, and the work continued. So Nehemiah had confronted those outside problems with the strength that came from his relationship with God. He overcame those problems. And then in chapter 5, Nehemiah discovered the biggest problem of, of all and the biggest challenge to his leadership. And it was going on right inside the Jewish community. It was an inside problem. And it was a moral problem. Yeah, I remember a number of years ago, a middle school teacher who was a member of my church came and talked to me uh, one, one day, and she told me they were having a real problem with bullying at the school at that time. And she thought that maybe I would like to address the issue in my next confirmation class, and so I did. I talked to the kids about what I had heard about what was going on at the school. I had, I had, I think, 25 kids in the class that year, and I didn't really believe that they were, were the ones who would be involved in something like that bullying, but, but I wanted them to know what was going on. I also wanted them to know that if they were one of the kids being victimized, being bullied, they could always come and talk to me. If it might be hard to talk to your parents, come and talk to me. Well, after that class was over, There was one girl who lingered behind as all the others were leaving the classroom. And when she was the only one left, she said, Pastor, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. What's up? And she said, I just wanted to let you know that I am one of the kids who is really being bullied badly. 
and some of the kids who are bullying me are right in this confirmation class. Well, I was stunned, to say the least. I could not believe that was happening right under my nose with kids who called themselves Christians. And that's exactly how Nehemiah felt when he heard about what was going on in and around Jerusalem. In the first verse of our text today, Nehemiah 5.1, we read, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. What, what was the outcry? We get the details in verses 2 through 5. Apparently that year there had been a shortage of rainfall and the harvest was thin, and the regular Jewish people who were already poor and oppressed, who were just barely getting by on the land that they could farm, were now on the verge of starvation. Many of them were in such dire straits that they had already mortgaged their fields and their vineyards and their houses to get money to buy food, to keep their families alive. But it wasn't enough. When their property was gone, the only thing they had left was their labor. And so many of them had been forced to sell their older children into debt slavery. Those young people, probably 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, would work to help pay off the family debt. And the parents then would work as hard as they could to keep the rest of the family alive. The hope was that they could manage to squirrel away a little bit of money so that they could eventually buy back the freedom of those children that they had sold into debt slavery. But it was really kind of a death spiral. The parents would usually fall deeper into debt until the only thing they had left to sell was themselves. And then the whole family would become debt slaves for life because there would be no one left to buy them back. Now, Nehemiah had already heard about this problem. We know that because in verse 8 we read that he and some of the men who had come with him from Persia had been using their own personal finances, the money they had brought with them, to buy back as many of those young people as they could from the surrounding nations and give them back to their families. So Nehemiah knew that this was a problem and he was trying to help. But what he heard from the people on that day uh, the news that really shocked him and stunned him is recorded in verse 5. The fathers and mothers who came to him with their complaints said this, Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaved, slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. Now, you might not have noticed the significance of that statement when I read it to you. When they said, our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children is as their children, they were saying that it wasn't just the hostile surrounding nations who were squeezing them and oppressing them and enslaving their children. Many of the people who were committing those sinful acts were their own Jewish brothers. You see, not all of the Jewish people living in and around Jerusalem were poor and oppressed. Some of them had done very well during the reign of the Persian Empire, and they had amassed some personal wealth. And when those people with some money came back to Judea, back to Jerusalem, they used that wealth to get more wealth by loaning money to their poor Jewish neighbors and then charging them interest that they were often not able to pay back. So pretty soon, these wealthy Jewish people held the deeds to many fields and many vineyards and many homes, and many of the Jewish teenagers were working as debt slaves for these wealthy Jewish men. And here's the worst part. Here's the really sneaky part. When these wealthy men heard that Nehemiah and his friends were buying back debt slaves from the surrounding nations, they were very quietly selling the, the slaves that they owned to wealthy men from the surrounding nations. And then those men turned around and sold them to Nehemiah. <laughs> so they were secretly taking advantage of Nehemiah's slave buyback program. <laughs> yeah, it kind of makes your blood boil, doesn't it? That's exactly how I felt when I learned that some of the kids who were doing the bullying were sitting right there in my confirmation class in front of me every Wednesday night and smiling. <laughs> Nehemiah says in verse 6, <clears throat> I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. And I think that might have been the understatement of the century because I think Nehemiah might have had steam coming out of his ears about now. And I love the next phrase. It's the first part of verse 7. 
Nehemiah says, I took counsel with myself. Now that is a very interesting phrase in Hebrew. And the commentaries that I read believe that it means Nehemiah had to take a moment by himself to calm down so that he could think through the situation and decide how he was going to deal with it. He literally had to step out when he heard this. Just give me a second. Yeah. Calm down, you know. God, calm my heart. And that brings us then to the second part of the story, which is this, the response of Nehemiah. <clears throat> After taking some time to settle his emotions, Nehemiah then summoned the people together in what he called a great assembly. In other words, he didn't just call the religious leaders together or, the, or he didn't just call the clan leaders together. He called together everyone who could be at this meeting. It was a mass meeting. And he probably stood on a high place. Maybe he stood on a section of the wall that had already been finished. He stood there and the people gathered around him and there was probably a buzz in the, in the air. What's the big announcement? <clears throat> what is Nehemiah going to say? And when everyone was there, the crowd was quieted down and Nehemiah began to speak. And he says in verse 7, he says, I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And everyone must have been shocked. The people all knew what was going on in Israel, but nobody knew what to do about it. And that was just the way things were. It's just, it just life. But now Nehemiah was saying to the Jewish people the same thing that he had said to Sanballat, the Samaritan, and the same thing he had said to all of the surrounding nations. He was saying, no more business as usual. Things are going to change today. And Nehemiah's first charge against the wealthy, wealthy nobles was this. He said, you are exacting interest each from his brother. You see, it was illegal, according to the law of Moses, for a Jewish person to charge interest on a loan to, an, to a, a fellow Jewish person. Now, you have to understand, lending money in those days was not exactly like it is in our day. In our day, people usually borrow money for big ticket items, you know, like a house or a car or a college education or something. Those are the big things that people want but don't necessarily need to survive. And lenders charge interest for those things. But in ancient times, uh, they didn't really have all those big ticket items. And so when people borrowed money in those days, they were borrowing it for food and other necessities. They were borrowing it because without that money, they may not survive. And the law of Moses said, if people uh, who are really poor and, and, and whose lives are in danger, if those people um, uh, are in need, then he said, first of all, if you're able, you should give them help as a gift out of the goodness of your hearts. But if people just say, no, I would like a loan, I need to get through a rough patch, you know, there may be a chance they won't be able to pay it back. But, but those who are able to loan money to them in, in the law of Moses were to earn mo or loan money to them at zero interest. That was the law. And so Nehemiah said to these, these men, he said, you are violating God's law. And then the second charge Nehemiah brought against the, the wealthy neighbors was this. He said, you even sell your brothers so that they may be sold back to us. He said, here we are buying back Jewish slaves from the surrounding nations, and I find out that you, many of you are the ones who are selling those young people to the surrounding nations. A blatant violation of the law of Moses. No Jewish person was ever allowed to sell another Jewish person uh, to, to the surrounding nations. It was not allowed. That was a horrible thing that these men were doing. And when it came time for them to answer the charge, as Nehemiah says, they were silent and could not find a word to say. <laughs> and Nehemiah then drove home his point. He said, the thing that you are doing is not good. That was his judgment. <clears throat> But he wanted them to know that there was someone else who had seen what they did. Someone else whose judgment they should worry about even more than his. Just like Pastor Inkfist, who wanted Hans to be aware of the one who was always watching. Nehemiah said to the wealthy nobles, Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God? Nehemiah left that question just kind of hanging out there. <clears throat> and then he said this. He said, here's what we're going to do. He said, first, 
let us abandon this exacting of interest. No more interest on loans to your fellow Israelites. Second, he said, return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses. These were the things that they were forced to put up as collateral just to get enough money to feed their families. He said, I want you to return those things. How can they ever even pay off their debts if they can't earn a living? And then third, he says, I want you to return the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been extracting from them. In other words, give back all of the interest that you have already collected from them. <laughs> Nehemiah presented these conditions in front of the whole crowd, and then he waited for the response of these wealthy nobles. And their response was exactly what Nehemiah hoped it would be. The wealthy nobles hung their heads in shame, and they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And they seemed to be truly ashamed of what they had done. And Nehemiah said, okay, if you are truly sorry in your heart, truly repentant in your hearts, let's take this to God. And then there in front of all the people and in front of the priests who served in the temple, those men vowed to honor this agreement that they had made that day. And Nehemiah said, all the assembly said, amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised you know, when I confronted my confirmation class about their part in the bullying at middle school, I didn't know how they would respond. Yeah, I waited till the very next Wednesday class, and I started out by doing all the normal things like taking attendance and collecting sermon reports, and then I said, now I have something that I want to talk to you about, and I, I really let them have it. You know, later I thought, well, boy, was I too hard on them, but I really... I said, you know, I talked to you about bullying last week, and since then it has come to my attention that some of you who are doing the bullying are right here in this class. You've been taking part in that. And I told them how, how very disappointed I was in them, and I let my anger show a little bit. But I told them there was someone else who saw everything that they were doing, whether they were in confirmation class or whether they were in school or whether they were on the playground or whatever, there was someone who they should be more concerned about than me. I told them those young people that they were making fun of, that they were bullying, were precious children of God. And how do you think God feels when you bully and ridicule and humiliate one of his children? And then I kind of, in a Nehemiah way, I said, what do you have to say for yourself? And that room was dead silent. And then one girl just burst out in tears and she turned to the girl who had spoken to me the week before, and between her sobs, she said, I am so sorry for the way I've treated you. And the other girl started crying too, and, 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 and the first one said, can you ever forgive me? And the second one said, of course I forgive you. And then a few other kids started to join in and, and, and confess their part in what was going on at the school and pouring out their hearts and saying I was mean or hurtful to this person or whatever or I saw others being mean and hurtful and bullying, and I didn't say anything, I didn't step up and do anything. And the, the stories and the tears went on for that entire class time. And uh, you know, it was the biblical definition of having hearts that were broken because of their sin. And it was the kind of repentance that God wants from all of us. And it was a really powerful moment uh, with that group. And I didn't really want to bring it to an end, but I had to. And so I said, People, I, I'm looking at you and I believe that your repentance is genuine and I've got some good news for you. If you truly repent in your heart, God has forgiven you. He has forgiven you because of what Jesus did for you on the cross because Jesus died on the cross for your sins. But you need to live this out now in your lives. I said, you need to go back to school tomorrow and you need to be determined never to bully another student ever again. And you need to be determined that when you see another person bullying someone, you're going to be the one that steps in and defends that person. And I said, can you do that? And they all said, yes. They all said, yes. I prayed for them. I sent them home. The following Sunday, that middle school teacher came up to me in church and said, what did you say to those kids on Wednesday night? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, these last two days in school, it's been like a different place. It's like a sea change, and all the teachers are talking about it. And she said, and our church kids, I can see they're right in the middle of it. They're leading this. And I just kind of smiled. 
Because that's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit changes hearts. And when hearts are changed, lives are changed. That's what happens when we truly repent of our sins. That's what happens when, when, when we know who our Father in heaven is and we walk in the fear of the Lord, our God. That's what happened with, with those kids. That's what happened in Nehemiah's day. And may it happen every day in every one of our lives that we might always be aware that we're walking in the fear of our God and we want to serve him and we want to treat his people right. Amen and amen. Please rise. And we're going to confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and we're going to sing today, God of grace and God of glory. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you might live in the hearts of each and every one of us who call ourselves by the name of Jesus Christ, that you might remind us that you are with us and watching us and walking with us every moment of our lives, and that living in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's power, we might seek to treat others as beloved, precious children of God, that we might never exploit or oppress or bully others, but that we might be kind and gentle and helpful. And we pray, Father, that, that our church might be one of those places in, in a community like Princeton where, where we make a difference because of our love because of the way that we welcome people and love people and reach out to help people. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for our families in the church on this Father's Day. Thank you for, for fathers and grandfathers and uncles and other adult men who seek to do your will and want to be men of God. 
And we pray that you would give them the strength to do that, that change and shape their hearts where that needs to be done. Prune away those things which, which are not good and strengthen those things uh, which you want to see in us. And we pray that each of our, our men in this congregation will want to be that kind of person that you have called them to be so that our families may be strong and they may be a blessing in this, in this community. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you so much for um, uh, Abe Adama, who is going to have his first communion today. Uh, thank you for that blessing that he's going to receive from you in the body and blood of Christ, in, with, and under the bread and the wine. And we ask that you uh, might help each and every one of us to remember how precious a gift it is to see and taste and touch our, our Savior, who gave us this sign, this sacrament, as a way of remembering what he did for us on the cross until the day when he comes again. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Father, for all those who are celebrating occasions, birthdays and, and anniversaries. Thank you for birthdays being celebrated by Rob Dunn and Parker Johnson, Ruth Ann Galantine and Lynn Holland, Kelly Phillips and Devin Keller and Emily Adama. Thank you for the birth of a new baby, Zane Howard Mary, uh, to Joshua Mary and, and to the baby's mother. And we thank you so much that, that, uh, for this blessing for Jody Feist, the grandma, and for great-grandparents Dale and Barb Feist. Thank you for anniversaries being celebrated this week by Brian and Ashley Bushy, Dwayne and Mary Ann Smith, Josh and Nicole Burke. Bless their marriages and all of the marriages in our church with your strength and your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray that you might uh, be with those who are ill or hospitalized or, or in need of any kind. We pray for those who are dealing with cancer, Kim Darrow, Marvin Hartz, Jeanette Dunn, Matt Scruggs, Matt's mother, Susan, Anna Meyer, others whose names that, that uh, we, we pray for in our hearts. We lift up also people with ongoing concerns, John Purvis, Kate Newby, Mary Hall, Sarah Himes. We pray that you might be with Pat Anderson, uh, who was hospitalized this week with her breathing issues. We pray also that you might be with Lonnie Swinford, who is at the hospital right now um, and is going to have a procedure to remove gallstones. And we pray that that procedure will go well and that they will not have to remove the gallbladder itself. We pray and lift up all of these concerns. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come now for all things are ready. And I, I, I invite the uh, family of Abe Adamow, family and friends, to come forward along the altar rail here. And as uh, I am handing out their communion, uh, the ushers will be coming down the aisles and handing out to the rest. And if you would hang on to that, and we'll commune together in a moment.
Father in heaven, thank you so much for Abe Adamow, who here with his family is, is receiving the body and blood of Christ for the first time. Bless him and strengthen him through this gift and also in his heart to continue to, to uh, strengthen his faith through the power of the Holy Spirit that as he grows, he may grow into the, to the man of God that you are calling him to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you guys may return to your seats. And as I step up to the altar, if the rest of you have your top part open and can remove the, the wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you. Receive the body of our Lord. Opening then the bottom part. This is the blood of Christ shed for your sin. Receive the blood of Christ. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Please rise for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we close today with hymn number 824. 824, this is my Father's world. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.